Hi everyone, so today on my walk I want to talk a little bit about the mutual intelligibility of Old English and Old Norse. So first, what do we actually mean by mutual intelligibility? It's a term that gets thrown around a lot and there are actually a few different definitions depending on who you ask. Now, most of the time what people mean when they say mutual intelligibility is that they mean speakers of two nominally different languages that can understand each other. So one will be able to speak in uh, their own language and another person in theirs and they'll be able to understand and communicate without too much difficulty. So some examples of this could be, for example, the Scandinavian languages. So Danish, Swedish, Norwegian, those are often considered to be mutually intelligible as well as say Dutch and Afrikaans. Uh, of course, for, for different reasons. So Afrikaans is a, a daughter language of Dutch. It was initially mostly Dutch. I think the vocabulary is 95% Dutch and that's why it's easy for speakers of those languages to communicate. But there are some languages that really it depends on your definition of what you consider to be mutually intelligible. Uh, for some people Danish, Norwegian, Swedish aren't considered mutually intelligible. Um, a further example could be Dutch and German. So I can understand an awful lot of what a German speaker is saying but I'm not sure if I would consider the two languages to be mutually intelligible. However, others might. So it depends on your definition. And that's going to be important for what I'm going to be talking about in this video in terms of Old English and Old Norse and whether the speakers of those languages would be able to understand each other and whether that constitutes mutual intelligibility or not. There's an absolute ton of wild garlic along the side of this road. And I remember playing in this forest as a kid and snacking on it when I got hungry, which is probably why I never had a girlfriend. Sad times. It's also quite funny while I'm talking about language and, and thinking about languages, about whether we can ever really have a bilingual brain or not. Because I guess with, with bilingual, it's that you have two languages in your brain, but it doesn't, being bilingual doesn't necessarily mean that you think of certain objects in both languages. For me, some words are just always Dutch words. When I think of an object, its essence, the word that comes to mind is, is Dutch. And I have that with English words as well. A lot of words are, are English in my mind rather than uh, Dutch, if that makes any sense. So, for example, behind me, there's a blackbird singing, but for me, Whenever I see the bird, I don't think of the word blackbird, I think of the word meerl, the Dutch word. Because of course, at home, I speak Dutch with my parents and when we're out walking and when I learned the birds, that was all in, in Dutch. So for me, the, the bird singing in the tree up there will always be a meerl rather than a blackbird. About to start recording and then this alarm went off behind me at some factory. <sighs> So something we should probably consider before we start looking at Old English and Old Norse as well is what we mean by these terms because Old English is a, a very broad label that's given to a language that's spoken from somewhere in the, the middle of the 5th century when these Germanic peoples move into what's now England and, and other parts of, the, uh, of Britain right up until about 1100 when usually the date is given for the, the transition from what's considered Old English into, into Middle English following the, the Norman conquest. And so that's a huge expanse of time. Uh, as well we have to remember that what's now seen as standard Old English is, is really just one dialect of Old English, the West Saxon dialect. So the, the, the version of Old English that was spoken uh, based on that which is written down in the late 10th century in Wessex. So it's only a really small part of England in a particular time frame because we have happen to have a lot of extant evidence of the language from that period that's being written down in manuscripts. But 
if you look at other dialects, we have surviving of, of, of the other dialects of Old English as well. If you think about Old English uh, from Northumbria, it's really quite different to Wessex. And so that's important for comparing it to Old Norse because actually the Northumbrian dialect of Old English does seem to already before contact or before significant settlement of uh, Norse speakers into those parts of England, it already was more similar. You have words like till instead of to. So uh, to is already till in the, the Northumbrian dialect of Old English just as it is in Old Norse. So it's not actually a borrowing in that case because it's already being used and, and that's important when we are considering this question. Now this of course is true for Old Norse at the same time because Old Norse it wasn't one language and it was spoken for a very long time and actually our standard for Old Norse is from already after Old English has transitioned into Middle English and our standard for Old Norse is based on sort of mid 13th century Old Norse or Old Icelandic as it was being spoken in Iceland. And so there's several problems with this. Again, it's based on the written form. We don't know what the spoken form was like and how similar it was to actually what's been written down because of course they didn't have any audio recordings so we can't hear them speaking. There are clues, for example, how they spell things and how different regions spell different things might allude to dialect. But we don't know what the, the, the spoken vernacular was like. Another problem with the extant Old Norse evidence is that, of course, the majority of the Scandinavians who came into England and interacted with Old English speakers were Danes, people from Denmark. And they were actually speaking a different dialect of Old Norse. They spoke Old East Norse, whereas the Norse that came onto Iceland and formed Old Icelandic and, and therefore the corpus of what we have remaining today of standard Old Norse, as you'll see it in a, in a textbook like that of Faulkner or someone else, that's from Old West Norse. So there's already a dialect difference and a time difference. And actually studies into Old Danish as it's often called because that's the, the term given to say 9th century Old East Norse being spoken in Denmark so by Danes who would have come over with for example the, the Great Heathen Army or, or raided before that uh, Old Danish is, is you know it's different in, in a fair few ways to that language that's recorded later in the sagas in Iceland which is what we have for the standard Old Norse. So there are key, key differences here um, between Old English from, uh, say, the standard textbook, which is the, the West Saxon dialect, late 10th century, and the Old Norse from the standard textbook, which is mid 13th century from Iceland. And, and that needs to be remembered when we're looking at mutual intelligibility, because actually it seems likely that if you had a Northumbrian from the 9th century and a Dane from the 9th century, that the languages they would be speaking, whether they would even be similar, were different or are different to what we will find in a textbook of either of the languages. If we look at our sources for interaction between Old English speakers and Old Norse speakers, um, two examples being the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and Asser's Life of Alfred, both are sources that, that document interactions in the 9th century, then we never hear about any kind of interpreters or that they have any trouble understanding each other or that they need to translate or anything like this. And this omission seems quite suspicious, um, or at least it does indicate that, that they can communicate with one another quite well because when there are speakers of, of languages other than Old English, so let's say Irish speakers or, or people who, who spoke Latin, then they do mention that there are these interpreters uh, that are there to translate from one language into the other so that they can understand one another. So the fact they don't mention this for uh, Old Norse speakers is potentially a sign that they would be able to understand one another. Uh, we also have another example, it's one of the texts that sometimes is attributed to King Alfred for having been translated by him, it's Orosius' Seven Histories Against the Pagans, or Seven Books of History Against the Pagans, and um, in one of the, let's say, additions to this, he, he writes about the, the, um, the coming to the court of King Alfred of, of a Norwegian, of a Norseman called Ottar, um, which is rendered in Old English as Ottara. And he's basically telling them about all these journeys and about where he's been. He comes from the very north of, of Norway and his travels all over the place across the North Sea. But there's no mention again that they can't understand him. They seem to be conversing with him just fine. Um, 
which which is again which is interesting which does suggest they are able to understand each other unless of course it's just easier for the dialogue it's just easier for the story that they're trying to tell if they can all understand each other maybe there was a translator and this is all translated it's we don't really know but again this omission does seem to suggest that they can indeed talk to each other fine While I was talking about the uh, Northumbrian dialect, I've got to say, while I've been walking, the accent of the old Northumbrian men that you come across has got to be just the best accent in all of the English language, especially when they've got dialect in there as well. Got a chiff chaff singing. Another literary example that we have of Old English speakers and Old Norse speakers interacting is from the late 10th century and this is the supposed interaction between the Earl Burtnoth and the, the messenger of the, the Danish, the Viking army uh, in the Battle of Malden, which we know was a historical event, it was fought in 991 in the reign of Ethelred the Unready. And we also have well, this poem about the battle, but of course we don't know if the person who wrote the poem was actually at the battle, if they had accurate information or not. But again, we do see that, at least in the, the poet's uh, thinking or, or perhaps recollection, if the poet was himself at the battle, that we do see again that they are able to communicate with one another, this interaction that goes over the, this stream um, that, that they have. Burtnoch Mathalode, Bord Hafenode, Wand Wagner Ash, Wurdum Melde, Ure and Anrad, Ageath him Answar. Ye hearest thou, Selida, what this folk saith. He willeth eo to Gafole, Gara Silan, Etrina Ort, and Eldas Wood, Tha here ye to fe eo at Hilden a deach, Brimman a Boda, a deod eft on yean. Say ye thinum leodum Michle Lather spell. That herstint unforkuth eol mit his werode, the wheel a yel gan ethel thusne, ethel redes eat, eldres mines folk and foldan, fail on shell and hathene at helde. To herlich me thinketh, that ye mit urum sheatum to sheep a gangon, unbefeochtene, nu ye thus feor hidded, on urne eat in the common, ne shell ye swa softer sinch ye gangan, us shell ord and edge. Air ye say man, grim gooth player, air we go full silon. That's pretty good. There's also a, a late 10th century gloss, um, which is a, a, a gloss essentially is you had a lot of manuscripts being written in this period. Um, a lot of them, most of them would be in Latin, although you do start to see them appearing in Old English as well with a lot more frequency in, in Alfred's reign, um, possibly due to, due to the Viking attacks because there were fewer people able to, to speak and write in Latin. So they, they went over to the vernacular because it was easier. Um, but essentially a gloss is where you have a, 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 a say and it's, it's kind of like a translation for a difficult word in a manuscript so a lot of the time in latin manuscripts you'd see an old english gloss so you'd have a, a nice old english word above a, a latin word to explain it for let's say the monks who weren't quite as good at latin or if it was a, a weird term that they hadn't come across then then they could do that and understand what it meant it says that the body of elderman ethelwolf was taken or carried to north Northworthy, but known in the Danish tongue as Derby, and of course we still call the settlement today Derby, so the Norse name stuck around, whereas the Old English Northworthy, uh, that this this name completely disappeared. But it's interesting for a number of reasons. One, because the chronicler made the effort to note that it was called Derby in the Danish tongue. Uh, also because this is the late 10th century, so it's over a century before the town was founded by, uh, or I'm not actually sure if Derby was founded by Scandinavians or whether that's just their name for it and it was an old English place beforehand. But it does suggest, as Matthew Townend has pointed out, that there was still Old Norse being spoken at the time. Because otherwise, why would they be referring to it as sometimes called in the Danish language Derby if everyone was already speaking Old English at this point? 
So it's a very interesting window into how long Old Norse was being spoken. But what it also points out is that this chronicler knew the Danish name, which perhaps indicates a certain degree of bilingualism. Um, and also that they didn't actually bother to anglicise the name as you often find. So if you go to Wales, a lot of the place names have an English name as well because it's, you know, the English people can't understand Welsh. One language that no one believes, or two languages that no one believes to be mutually intelligible, are English and Welsh because they're completely different. But the fact that none of the elements of Derby have been anglicised, that they're just kept as the Old Norse form, does perhaps suggest again that there is this mutual intelligibility between the two languages. A lot of the time with the Danish place names or the Old Norse place names in England, um, they are actually attested as having been places before, but that you see that the, they take the two place name elements, so let's say you have uh, Hamtun or somewhere, um, they take the two elements and then they, they change those elements into the Old Norse cognates of the Old English. So if it was Hamtun, it might become something like Hamby, for example. It's, I'm just making this up completely off the top of my head. But there are a lot of examples of this going on. And this does suggest that the Old Norse speakers coming in could understand the names of the Old English places or otherwise they wouldn't be sort of directly translating the individual bits of the settlement name that's made up there. Um, what's important as well, I think, is that there's not all that many Old Norse words that get borrowed into Old English. It's a bit of a misconception because there's a lot of uh, words that, that are borrowed from Old Norse in modern English, but there's not all that many from the period of Old English itself. But in Middle English, you get thousands of them. Now, the reason for this is not that you had some kind of huge influx of Scandinavians coming into England in the uh, 12th century, 13th century, but rather that the words were already there in the spoken language, but not in the language that was being written down. And it's kind of the point I made at the start of this video. And I think that's, that's a very interesting thing to consider because at the end of the day, the spoken language is always different at this time to what's being written down because not everyone is speaking the same way. As I already said, the kind of standard Old English that we have is based on the West Saxon dialect from a particular period. Of course, Wessex was never thoroughly colonized by Danes, whereas places in the north and the east of England were. And so that's why when it comes to the Middle English period, you get a kind of dissipation of a lot of the Old Norse words from the north and the east start to make it into your standard English at the time. And unfortunately, we just don't have that many documents written in the Old English of Northumbria, of East Anglia, of Eastern Mercia from the period of the Danish settlement. We do start to see chronicles and things like the Ormium, um, and I think potentially the, the Peterborough Chronicle and things like this that are written in these kinds of areas later when it's Middle English. And that's when we see loads of Old Norse words coming in. But unfortunately we don't have that for the Old English period. If we did, it might make things a lot more clear as to the relationship between Old English and Old Norse. If they are glossing Old Norse uh, words or Old English words to make it easier for the others. Because there's a lot of theories as to how it went in the Dane law area, the areas of Scandinavian settlement in terms of language. Did they, for instance, within a generation stop speaking Old Norse and start speaking Old English? Uh, it's a possibility because a lot of the, let's call them the second generation Danes were born to English mothers because we don't have that much evidence that there were a lot of Scandinavian women that came over. And it's called your mother language, your mother tongue for a reason because mothers seem to play a much more important role in uh, the language that you speak. And so if they were being born to English mothers, you know, there were loads of English kids around them, it's likely that they started to speak Old English. It's not the only theory. There's also the theory that there was bilingualism that went on for a very long time. Uh, that certainly seems to be the case if we think of all these loan words that we have in, well now in standard English, but especially in the dialects of places like uh, Yorkshire, Northumbria, and to a, to a lesser extent, the, the areas of, of Eastern England to the South. It's also a possibility, or you get some kind of creolization 
influence of dialect and mix between the two that starts to be spoken or potentially all three in different areas so really the cards are all out look at all that wild garlic absolutely wild um just like the linguistic scene in post scandinavian settlement england anyway i hope you've enjoyed this one it's been kind of random but uh i'll see you soon stay safe